starting with the Monday section because they are one week behind. Uh, I wanted to share the recording of the morning section with the Monday section, but it is a small class and it's a very quiet class. Unlike your class who is active, who uh, is full of energy, who answer questions, but I cannot blame them. They're like half your uh, number. So I'm telling you this because I want you to know that you are being recorded and shared with another class. So if you want to be more active than usual, it's gonna be really awesome. Also, if you can put your cameras on for at least the first 10 minutes, it's really great to see you. Remember, it's, only, it's my only chance to be able to uh, not really communicate, but probably interact in a better way with you. All right, so it's optional and it's really, really, um, I would be really happy to see you. All right, let, me, let us start with questions you may have. Do you have any questions? I know that deadline for the coming lab reports is not soon and probably you did not start and most probably you don't have questions. But yeah, if you have any question, we can talk about it now. Any question? Doctor? Yes. Yes, Doctor, in the lab report uh, six, rotational inertia, uh, you didn't ask for the uh, uncertainties, you know, the propagation of error, but I did them and I want to make sure is that they are correct. Can I include them in yes. the report? So, Yes, of course you can include them. However, I remember you only had one to do, right? Let me check. There were, no, we calculated theoretical values and experimental values. That's so why. the theoretical values, you had to do the percent, the propagation of error, right? Yes. In this spot. For experimental values, it was only average and RMS, am I right? Uh, and for five, the... Uh, yeah, definitely, twice. The formula, which is uh, MR squared. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's a lot of 18. errors. Yes. <laughs> so you think that's not enough and you wanted to do more? No, I just wanted to practice them. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, of course. And so probably, I can yeah, sometimes we don't ask you to do it for each and every one because just to reduce uh, the difficulty and the length of the lab report. But yeah, if you believe this will help you uh, have a good uh, margins for your lab report, why not? And as you said, it's a good practice. So again, we cannot study for the midterm, neither the final exam. That's the only way. You see? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. All right, Kausar. Any other question? I can see students feel so down. Nobody wants to be on the camera. And I totally understand. Any other question? No questions? Your silence is means no question for me. I'm going to start lab eight. Um, I heard from the first, uh, the morning group, that you did not do standing waves in the course yet. And you barely remember anything from high school, like nothing at all. And which is okay. Standing waves are very easy to understand. Uh, it's important to really grasp the theory for you to be able to see the, all the aspects of the lab report. And I hope I can do that with you. Uh, the outline. I'm going to cover what are standing waves in general. And probably if you can throw anything you remember, even if it's wrong, it's going to help us out. Standing waves on a wire. I think wires are easily, like you can easily see what's happening on a wire. However, as you see, the title is in an air column or in a tube. So we're not doing any wire in here. But if you do understand what's happening in a, on a wire, probably you can understand what's happening in a tube. The wire, I'm going to study only fixed ends. For the tube, I'm going to study uh, open ends and fixed ends. All right. OK, I'm going to remove this. Now, and then I need to discuss what is displacement nodes and what are pressure nodes. And I suppose you have no clue what I'm talking about. I will explain. Eventually, the experimental setup, like the material that we need. Then procedure and measurements, because uh, if I don't do that, I cannot wrap up and probably you won't be able to see because uh, most of our measurements are indirect. Like sometimes we need to measure something, but we do it indirectly because uh, uh, we don't always have the choice to do it directly. And this will be very confusing for you. Like we did exactly in the inertia, rotational inertia, we had to measure I, but we measured the acceleration of the hanging weight instead. 
and we wanted eye of the ring, but we measured eye of the ring and disc together instead. So you see, it's all indirect measurements. And I know this will induce a lot of confusion, especially if you don't understand the theory well. You will end up confusing what's small m, what's big m, and so on, you know? So it's very important to go slow and well and study and steady. What are standing waves? Anything you remember? Yes. Meanwhile, I'm going to move this to the side. Anything you remember, standing waves and wrong answers are really welcome. Standing waves, anything. You took some in grade 11, some in grade 12. It's a stationary wave. All right. It's a great way to say it. It is stationary. And I believe you said stationary due to the fact that standing stationary wave but you know the definition of wave is uh, is not a vibration so a wave usually has a speed and has a wavelength so it's something moving forward but for a standing wave it has to be stationary and that's the interesting part it's an oscillating wave all waves are basically oscillating so these are words i'm going to write everything oscillating waves oscillating waves all waves actually make the medium vibrate up and down or forward, backward, depending if it's longitudinal or transverse. So I have local oscillation anyway. So all waves would be oscillating waves, not standing waves only. Peak amplitude is constant. What do you mean? Amplitude is constant. All right. Most of the wave, like all waves have, they do have constant amplitude. If we're talking about a fact, a case where I have no damping, amplitude. If I'm talking about a case where I have no damping, uh, two opposite waves of specific frequency and amplitude. I love this. So uh, just a second. Yes, Reem. No, you cannot play at the iPad. I'm recording the session. Please disappear. Go, 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 go. Thank you. All right, I muted myself on WebEx. I did not mute myself on Zoom. It's so funny. Anyway, it wasn't a big deal. So back to you. Uh, I was saying uh, two opposite waves. So Kausar is saying the standing wave is a result of two waves that are opposite or opposing each other, opposite. Let me write opposite and then think about it again. They can be in phase if their amplitudes match. Ooh, yeah, probably I can summarize it, Jana, by saying a standing wave basically is the result, the result of, of, uh, of a superposition, of a superposition, position, position of two waves and you're talking about constructive interference, right? Interference by the simple fact of saying, if I don't see what I'm typing, I type it wrong. So uh, by the simple fact of saying that the amplitudes are adding up, if they do actually match, probably you mean constructive interference versus destructive interference, or probably you want to mention that standing wave pattern, the standing wave pattern does not always happen like you need conditions so what are the conditions you're talking about some conditions you said if right i i read if so their e cancel out or add up yeah by e you mean energy or probably amplitude anyway they're somehow related yeah so what else do you remember by the way you remember a lot what we just wrote is a brainstorm, like some brainstorming ideas, some of which are accurate, some of which are not. So let's discuss, start with what are standing waves. And for me to discuss what standing waves are, I need to review what is a wave, you know? To create a wave, you need a vibration. So the vibration is the cause and the wave is the result. The vibration is a local back and forth motion. It's periodic, it has an amplitude, it has a frequency. However, it does not have a speed because it does not go forward. The result of the vibration, if you have the appropriate medium, will create a wave. And the wave is something that would travel forward. So it has a speed and it has a wavelength, you know? 
let me start by the definition of speed and wavelength. The wavelength is the length between two peaks. So if you're watching uh, water waves in a container or on the beach, you can measure the length between two, two peaks and the length is gonna be in meters, obviously. And you call it wavelength or lambda, the, the Greek letter for it. If you measure the time taken between the two peaks, it's gonna be the period, all right? Or, and you're gonna consider this to be one cycle. That's why the time taken will be only one period. Um, now discussing the speed in general, speed of the wave is total distance over total time. And since we're talking about a constant speed, we can take not really a, a total distance. We can take only the distance between two peaks that I'm gonna call lambda. And instead of the time, I'm gonna take the time between two peaks, which is the period. And since one over period is the frequency, it's gonna be lambda times the frequency, okay? Now talking a bit about uh, units. You tell me what is the unit of the, of the, I'm gonna pick blue, of the speed. Unit of the wave speed, SI units. Yes, I hear you. SI unit of the speed of the wave, meter per second. Uh, SI unit for the wavelength, length, meters, thank you, Carl. And what would be the SI unit for the frequency? Yeah, it's gonna be Hertz or one over seconds. You know, Hertz is number of cycles per second. So you would see meter in here. Let me change the color into purple. So this is meters and this is one over second, or you can call it Hertz. This would give you eventually meter per second. So it makes so much sense, yeah to have a look at the different uh, units, right? All right, so this is a wave, this is one wave. Now to be able to create a standing wave, you need to understand that you have two waves opposing each other. One wave going in this direction and the other wave is going in the opposite direction. They will actually meet and they will actually superpose or add up. Sometimes they're gonna create random waves and if they uh, follow some conditions, they're gonna show you uh, interference. And interference in our case would show you a standing wave. Let me start by describing the standing wave before discussing the conditions. A standing wave actually, uh, so that's a medium between A and B, I have a certain medium. It could be water, it could be air, it could be a wire. It's a medium eventually, I'm not talking about vacuum yet. This point is not vibrating at all. You can pluck it with your fingers and you can see the standing wave is not gonna be affected, all right? So this is a point that is not moving at all. And this is a point that is not moving at all. And like exactly the bright and dark fringes, if you remember interference from high school, that's with an if, because I don't know what happened in high school. And this is a region where you have very high oscillation, like maximum amplitude oscillation up and down, you know? Like you can imagine a boat on the surface of water and the boat is going up and down with very high amplitude. For the points that are in this location, they're gonna go up and down at the lower amplitude. So again, this point will give you no motion whatsoever. So standing wave would mean this point is not gonna move, neither right, neither left, neither up, neither down. And maximum amplitude is gonna happen on this boat and not on this boat. And it's not, the wave is not gonna go like forward or backward. It's a standing wave. It is a result of two waves. The best way to create beautiful standing waves is to consider an incident. So this is an incident wave and the reflected wave, because usually, let me change the pen, and the reflected wave, okay? So incident waves and reflected waves are usually of the same amplitude, same frequency, depending on the reflection, because we have two types of reflection. If I have a fixed end or, in, or a free end, I will have different types of standing waves, all right? So, so far we know how we do a standing wave. We don't know the conditions yet. We know how to describe a standing wave. It is standing, so some points are not moving, some points are moving with high amplitude. I'm gonna move to the next section, which is standing wave on a wire to discuss a bit the conditions. 
All right, so what do I have? This is Jenna holding the wire from this side. It could be her shoelace. And I told the other section, I'm gonna try to create standing waves, holding a shoelace with somebody helping me with the other fixed end. And probably this is Christopher. So Chris is holding the wire from the other side. All right. Chris is a fixed end, so Chris is not going to move his hand. And Jenna will create the vibration, the needed vibration with an actual frequency. I will try it. I will cheat a bit because it's very difficult on my shoulder and my wrist. Like I will turn my hand a bit because it helps. I'm going to show you probably one loop, two loops. And if you're lucky, I'm going to do three loops because three loops would want me to go really, really fast. I mean, by fast at high frequency and usually I cannot. It depends on how heavy the shoelace is and the tension in the shoelace, like how strong we're pulling on the shoelace, you know, because it actually matters. And I will tell you why in a moment. So here I created, so Jana actually created a vibration. Uh, you see the incident wave and then the reflected wave. And what you see is not the incident, not the reflected, but the resultant. This point is gonna vibrate so high amplitude. This point, no vibration. This point, no vibration, okay? And yeah, if she increases the frequency, you're gonna see very high amplitude, very high amplitude, no motion whatsoever. If you really look close, you will see that this is equivalent to the full wavelength, okay? So if you take the wavelength of the incident wave and the wavelength of the reflected wave, which is the same, you will notice and that the resultant wave will have a wavelength the same, which means if you want to call this a loop, and this is another loop, another loop, 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 and loop, you can probably tell how long a loop is. And probably I can ask you in this case, if the whole thing is one lambda, how long is one loop? It is half a lambda. So is that half a lambda as well? So let's assume that all the loops are half a lambda. All the loops are half a lambda. This is half a lambda. This is half a lambda. Okay, and let's assume that the length of the wire did not change. Jana is only uh, making the vibration faster in frequency, but the length of the wire is still the same. Uh, the position of Jana and the position of Chris is, did not change and the length of the wire is still the same. So can I say that in this case, the length of the wire, all of it can fit only one lambda, so change the pen the length is equal to one, I mean one loop, so one lambda over two, right? So the length here would be how much? How many lambdas over two, if you count them? How many loops? I can see two loops, right? So two lambda over two. And in this case, I'm gonna see how many lambda over two so I can see three lambda over two. So L is gonna be three lambda over two. All right, so three lambda over two, okay? So this is what they're actually trying to write. And if you want, you can write lambda to be in terms of L. So this is case one, case two, case three, case four, and this is case N, which is here. When you have n loops, you can call them first order, second order, third order, fourth order. You can tell them, you can call them first harmonic, second harmonic, third harmonic, and fourth harmonic. And you can notice that lambda is a variable, isn't it? How come L can fit sometimes two loops and sometimes four loops? Obviously, lambda is a variable. Lambda is getting smaller. Can you tell me why lambda is getting smaller? What Jana did and how Jana, how she managed to decrease lambda. Exactly, she was increasing the frequency of the vibration or the wrist or the hand or whatever. So 
Slow vibration, you get one loop. Faster, you get nothing, chaos. A bit faster, you get two loops. A bit faster than faster, you will get chaos. Chaos means you will get a superposition of incidents and reflected, but you don't get interference because they don't match properly. So you have only frequency one, two, three, four, between which you have no standing waves. Only at those frequencies, you will have standing waves. Let's try to calculate the frequency. Uh, yes, let me try green. Like none of the colors would actually make sense on this uh, on this font, on this uh, background. So let's find the frequency F. How do you calculate the frequency if we are given lambda? Where's my pen? Yes, the frequency. Didn't we say previously probably here that frequency is V over lambda? I'm going to try this. So frequency is V over lambda, right? And I know here that lambda is 2L. So it's going to be times uh, 2L. 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 OK, 2L. That's frequency 1 or the first harmonic. For frequency, frequency 2, it's going to be um, V, all right, over lambda. But I'm going to try it. I'm going to try to write it. What's that? OK. Mistake, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I wanted to write something else. Okay. Let me write it again. So it's V over lambda, and I'm gonna replace lambda by 2L. Okay, that's the first harmonic. Here I'm gonna replace lambda by L, uh, and to be honest, I'm gonna replace it by 2L times two. Okay, so I'm using this. And then to find F3, I will say it's V over 2L times three. I'm just trying to show you that F of the nth order or the nth harmonic is going to be V over 2L times N, which means all the frequencies are a multiple of the first one. You see? So the second harmonic is the double as the, as the first, and the third harmonic is the triple of the first. And any frequency in between will not give you standing waves. It's going to give you random frequency like random uh, wave that I'm gonna I'm not gonna call standing it's not actually standing yes now n n is an integer one two three it's a positive integer yeah so so far we're discussing standing waves on a wire and I have a fixed end next we're gonna study what happens when I have an open end all right but before discussing the standing wave in a tube this is regular reflection I have a pulse that is incident. It's gonna hit a wall or a pole and the end is fixed. Due to the Newton third law, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The, ro the, 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 the rope is gonna pull on the pole and the pole is gonna give a force to the rope that is equal and opposite. So you will have reflection downward. So when the incident pulse is positive, the reflected pulse is negative. And let's say I don't give a pulse, I give a continuous wave, incident wave, it's going to give me a continuous reflected wave. So I'm going to have incident reflected standing wave, it's continuous. So the standing wave is not going to finish until I stop. It's beautiful, it's a standing wave. However, it's the superposition of an incident pulse positive and a reflected pulse negative. Uh, they do cancel out at some point. That's why you have those uh, those nodes. Let me show you. Those is where they cancel out. And here is when they add. Okay, So depending on the motion of the incident and the reflected waves. If I have an open end or a free end, this end is free to move because you have a ring and the ring can go up and down the pole. And you can try it with a shoelace by simply standing on a high table, holding one end and doing a pulse. And this other end is fixed. Nobody's holding it. You will see a tiny reflection that would go up. And the reflection happens from the same side. It's very visible. It's very light though, so you need to look well probably create a slow motion uh, video to see it. But yes, you can see it. So this is the incident pulse that is positive. The reflected pulse will also be positive, all right? So this is the reason why we have different standing waves when I have a fixed end or an open end. 
for a tube, it's very easy to have a fixed end and an open end. I'm talking about a flute, you know? The flute could, can have an open end or a closed end and you can change, you know, the flute has some holes and by closing each hole, you can change the end of the tube or the length of the tube in a way because when the, the you have a hole, it's like the end of the tube in a way. All right, so now tubes. This is a tube. It's closed from here. So the tube is basically only this, okay? So this is the length of the tube. And here, this is the length of the tube because apparently I can modify the length of the tube. So you see what variables we have here. And this end is open. Who's creating the vibration? I don't know yet. Most probably like in our experiment, it's a, it's a speaker or somebody shouting, but definitely it has to be, it has to be sinusoidal. So I cannot use my voice, neither an instrument, because you know, instruments would give you uh, not a sinusoidal wave, it is a complex wave because sinusoidal waves are simple waves. Usually a tuning fork would do the job, a whistle will give you a sinusoidal wave, or a speaker connected to a function generator that would be set on a certain frequency, a certain signal. Otherwise, it's going to be a complex signal, which is the sum of many sinusoidal waves. So definitely your voice is going to be somehow complex and sometimes random, okay? Anyway, you see that you're going to have half a loop or one loop and a half, because at the open end, you will always have this maximum vibration. Now I need to remind you and then ask you a question. If the loop has a length of lambda over two, okay? My question for you is, how long is this? Which is half a loop. It's lambda over four. Thank you, Kausar. So now the length of the tube is lambda over four. Here in this case, the length of the tube is how many lambda over four? It is, yes, three lambda over four. It's always Carl and Romy and Kausar. And some students I've been grading today, I've never heard of you. Like, I don't wanna give names because I don't wanna be, I want to be fair, but Omar, I never heard of Omar. Omar, talk to me. Marianne, Karen, Emilio, talk to me. Say it wrong. I can't remember if you say it wrong. Usually I remember only the right answer. So you can say it wrong. And in this case, L is how many lambda over four? Yes. How many lambda over four? Five lambda over four, four, over four. So can you come up now with a general term for L, like in terms of, eva like for, this is the first order, right? The first harmonic, the second harmonic, the third harmonic, or case one, case two, case three. What can you say? Is that a bit tough? Just say anything and we can fix it together. N lambda over four. Can you tell me a bit, Carl, what is N? So is n an integer? All integers are allowed. Yes. Only odd, thank you, Marilyn. So we're gonna take only the odd values. And to take the odd values, you're gonna see in the course, it's gonna be written as 2n plus one. 2n plus 1, 2n is always even, plus 1 is going to be always odd. So 2n plus 1, lambda over 4. And, uh, and if you really think about it, this is order 1. So order 2 for it to be 3, it has to be, let me think about it. If I do 2 times 2, so it's going to be 2n minus 1 probably for it to work. Uh, so 2, if I take this to be n, 2n minus 1 is going to give you 3. And 2n here minus 1 is going to give you 5. So how about I write it as 2n minus 1 and all of it is going to be lambda over 4. And how about I keep this one to the course and 
cross it out for the moment. I can simply say this and keep in mind that n is odd. I can simply say n can be one, three, five, seven, nine, whatever. All right, because we I don't want math to be your obstacle. But in the course, you're gonna deal with those equations, okay? In the lab, we're gonna write this one. Keep in mind n is only odd because of the open end. One open end. Sometimes you have two open ends, by the way. If you have just a tube open from both sides, but we're not gonna do that in this lab. All right, so now we're gonna discuss displacement nodes and pressure nodes. And for me, these are vocab words, like keywords. You already know them, you just need to know their names. This is a standing wave on a wire, and you can see four loops. So you can say L is four times lambda over two and so on. I'm gonna call this point a node. Why a node? Because it's not moving at all. And I'm discussing a displacement node because I just said moving. So I'm talking about motion and therefore about displacement. Displacement node means no, so node is no motion, okay? Uh, by the way, a node means, you know what's a node in English? So it looks like a node anyway. So it is like a node. And this is another displacement node. And this is another node. And the, the edges would be node if they're actually fixed. Whenever you have a very big amplitude displacement, we're going to call it anti-node. All right? So anti-node for high amplitude displacement and node for no displacement at all. And the distance between two consecutive nodes is going to be equal to lambda over two. So these are only new words for you. The bad news is we're dealing with, with, with sound, right? And sound is actually not a transverse wave. Uh, no, it has to be maximum amplitude. So Jana, only the maximum amplitude is the anti-node. This is not anti-node. This is not anti-node, only this one. Okay, it has to be like the middle between a node and a node. Yeah, so now back to the microphone, it measures pressure and not displacement. And to be honest, since we're dealing, title is standing wave in an air column, we're dealing with sound. And what's the difference between sound, a sound wave and a water wave, or a sound wave and a wave on a wire? What's the difference? Exactly, the sound wave is a longitudinal wave. However, the light, uh, I mean the, 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 the light wave or the wave on a wire or the wave on water surface, they are transverse wave. And what's the difference? How, how do you uh, explain the difference between a longitudinal wave and a transverse wave? How do they behave differently? If they move parallelly or perpendicularly to the length of the wave. Exactly. So you see the motion here, the, the motion is up and down, right? So you see the loop, like the loop is, it has a shape up and down. For sound, and you can put your hand in front of your mouth, and the sound is actually longitudinal. So you're not going to see those loops. I'm so sorry we've been discussing loops since uh, 4.30, but uh, we're doing that only because it's easier to visualize. A sound will not show you loops like that. I know you cannot see them anyway, but they're not actually, they don't actually exist. Instead, you have some motion and this motion is gonna create some high pressure and low pressure. This is high motion. So now I'm gonna pick green to show you high amplitude right and left motion. And here I have no motion at all. High amplitude right and left motion and here no motion at all. Now imagine all the motion of air particles is going in this direction. Let me change to blue. And all motion of all particles, air particles are going in this direction. They will create a region here of very high pressure. And the region here is gonna be very low pressure. Why low pressure? Because the particles are escaping this point. I'm talking about air particles. So low pressure is going to be measured by a microphone with no sound at all. And high pressure will be measured by the microphone by 
a lot of sound, you know? So when the microphone will give you a very high sound, it is an odd, and this is somehow very important to know. So in the experiment, when you hear something very loud, it is an odd, unlike what you think, okay? Keep that in mind. So when I have a displacement node, this one, I'm gonna call it displacement node. However, it's gonna be a pressure antinode. And for this one, it is a displacement antinode and it's gonna be pressure node, okay? Like here, this one we already did. I'm gonna use purple. So it is a, can you tell me this point? What is it? It is a displacement node, Jana, and a pressure antinode. Perfect. You just have to guess one. If you want to draw the loops, the loops are the displacement. And the pressure is the opposite, so don't make a big deal out of it. I will try to explain it even more. However, I don't want to confuse you. I tried to use this diagram with the other group. It was confusing. That was a bit easier. This shows a very high pressure. So you see the particles are closed, are very close to each other. You can call it compression. And this is very low pressure. You can call it rarefaction, very high pressure, compression, rarefaction. So you don't actually see the loops, but you actually see like a repetition of some fringes, if you want to call them, black and dark fringes, like in a standing, but we don't call it standing wave. We call it interference of light, if you want to really think about it as such. Anyway, I don't want to confuse you. We can move on to the experimental setup. So what we have, we have a tube, it's a long tube around one meter, you can see most of it here, okay? However, I'm not interested in the length of the tube, I'm interested in the length between the beginning of the tube and the piston. So this translucent piston is the thing that is gonna stop the waves from going farther. So they're gonna get reflected on the piston and this is a fixed end, like a closed end. This would be an open end because I have a speaker, like it's open. This is a speaker, I don't know if you recognize it. And these are the plugs of the speaker. I'm gonna use an adapter and then a BMC cable, which is a thick cable, like coaxial cable, which means you have two cables inside. And I'm gonna connect them to a function generator to make sure I have a sinusoidal signal. If I zoom in, let me try. This is sinusoidal signal. And you know, I want to create sinusoidal and you can see the result in here, right? So this is the amplitude knob. So you can have high voice and low voice and it's gonna be very annoying. When you watch the video, I want you to listen to me but you will be bothered by the sound. Uh, however, I'm using very low amplitude. This is the frequency knob. And this, these are the frequency ranges. Like for example, if you click on one kilohertz, uh, this measures up to one kilohertz, if I'm not wrong. And these are the decimals, like you can do half of it and so on. And, or you can simply do this guy multiplied by whatever value you have here, okay? So you can study the smallest subdivision if you want. So now the speaker is gonna create some noise, some sound, let me call it sound. The frequency of which you can vary, you know, high frequency would give you high pitch, very narrow. A low frequency will give you low pitch, which is really a deep uh, sound. And amplitude will give you high volume, low volume, and so on. You can play with it for a while. You can bother your friends as well. Probably your partner is gonna scream at you and eventually you're gonna settle down to the frequency you need for the lab report and very low amplitude, I hope. Then you have a tiny mic uh, microphone in here. Your job for the first part of the experiment is to keep it at the very far end of the tube, okay? The microphone is connected to the oscilloscope. I know you can hear everything you want, but let's not use your ears as a sensor. Let's use an actual sensor connected to the microscope, to the, to the oscilloscope. Uh, the first part of the experiment is you need to find the length, let me show you where, like this one, which length will give me resonance. You know, L1 will give me resonance, L2 will give me resonance, 
L3 will give me resonance. Any length in between will give me randomness. How do I know resonance? I know resonance from high sound because usually when you have a certain number of uh, half a loop, it will be the amplitude is going to be nice and you can hear it high. And whenever you have randomness, it's going to average out to zero and very low noise. Okay. So since you're not moving the microphone, it's going to give you the average. And the average is nice and steady and high if you have resonance. And resonance means one uh, harmonic of standing waves. Okay. Back to the setup, which is here. Yes. And you will see those, the signal is going to be very high. And sometimes it's going to be very low. So you will move the piston back and fro until you find the position at very high and you're going to write it down. These are the results. For example, for frequency 1.5 kilohertz of the sound, I got resonance for this length, resonance again for this length, resonance again for this length. Most probably this is lambda over four. This is three lambda over four. That's the length of the tube. And this is five lambda over th four. However, I'm not sure because I cannot see the loops. But there is one thing I'm sure about, which is the following. What happens, and this is a question for you. If I take L3, which is this, minus L2, what do I get? How many lambdas? So again, I'm doing L3 minus L2. How many lambdas do I get? One loop, which is lambda over two. So this is what we're gonna do, I'm sorry. So back to our results. I'm gonna take this minus this and write it down here, it's lambda over two. Then take this minus this, write it down here, it's lambda over two. This minus this, right? So I don't know what each length represents, but I know since they are consecutive, giving me resonance, the difference between the length is an actual loop. This I'm sure about. Because nobody knows if it's an open uh, tube or a closed tube, or if I don't, probably the first one is not lambda over four, probably it's five lambda over four. And for some reason, I cannot go closer because of the piston, the tube, anything. But I know for a fact that two consecutive lengths, the difference between them will give me lambda over two. So I'm gonna find all these lambda over two. Obviously I cannot do this one because there's nothing uh, longer. The tube has a limited length. And then I'm gonna find the lambdas. You will see that lambda is gonna be fluctuating around a constant value because it's not gonna change, it's a constant. And find the average, the RMS. Repeat for a different frequency. Smaller frequency means bigger lambda. That's why you have less number of modes because the lambda is bigger and you cannot fit a lot of loops in one tube. And smaller frequency meaning much bigger lambda so you can fit only three modes. And lambda is gonna be different for each set of frequencies, uh, for each frequency, obviously. Now the speed of sound can be found from this equation, the experimental speed of sound. It depends on the temperature in degree C. I got these measurements and I took the measurement of the temperature and this is a picture of my thermometer. I want you to have a look at the smallest subdivision divided by two to know the uncertainty. So I'm not sure about my 18, if it's 18.0 or 18.00 or probably simply 18. So you write it down, you fix it, you find the V of sound and find the uncertainty if needed, okay? So, so far, we're not moving the microphone, we're only moving the piston. Next. Okay, this is a big picture of the setup from Pasco that is very similar to what we have, but not exactly the same. Probably I wanted to show you the list of material needed. All right, now, the next part of the experiment, I will pick, let me show you, sorry for jumping between the slides. I will pick one frequency, which is one kilohertz. I will pick one kilohertz, will, I already measured those lengths. I know for a fact that each will give me resonance, okay? So I wrote the different lengths here that I measured, actually students, 
two semesters ago do, did those measurements. And now my job is to move the microphone inside the tube. I want to count how many maxima and minima I have. Let me show you how. In this case, if I start here, I get a maxima, then a minima, then a maxima, then a minima, then a maxima, and I'm not going to hit the piston. So this would be one, two, three, four, five. So it's the mode, you see? However, I did a mistake. This should not be a maxima. It is a minima because the microphone measures the pressure, which is the opposite. So minima, maxima, minima, maxima, minima. Anyway, my job is not to know which is maxima, which is minima. It's only to count the extremes, if you want to call it, like the, the extrema, all right? So like here you have half a loop. So you're going to count one maxima or minima. So it is a minimum. And here you're going to count two minima and one maxima, like a total of three, you know? And then five, and then seven, and then nine. In this case, uh, these are not something I we actually deduced. We actually counted them. If I know, I need to go back to the, where's my oscilloscope? We were actually looking at very high amplitude then at very low amplitude. Very low amplitude is a minima in pressure, so a maxima in displacement, and so on. We simply counted them. And then they will ask you to plot L versus N or N versus L. I can't remember, and I don't want to help you on that level. And you will obviously see that they're proportional, and you will get a straight line passing to the origin. You will find the slope. From the slope, you find you deduce the velocity, and so on. By the way, we forgot something. Back to this diagram. We said V, right? And we said that. Fn is proportional to the first harmonic, which is here. We assumed V to be constant. And now my question for you is, is there a way Jana can vary V? What can I do? Like, I know how to vary frequency. I know how to vary the length. The length, I move the piston closer, or I cut the shoelace shorter, I would vary the length. For frequency, Jana can move her hand faster, like in frequency, or for the tube, I can set my speaker at higher frequency. But my question is, how can I vary the velocity? That if I can. And this is very important. Think about it for a bit. Velocity in the case of a wire or velocity in the case of a tube. How can I vary the velocity? Let's say I want to increase the velocity. What do I do? No idea? Do you think this would help you? All right, so are you saying that the speaker, which is in this case called Jana, where's Jana? Jana, Jana, Jana is here. Jana is the speaker for the tube, right? So when you say temperature, you're not talking about the speaker, you're talking about the medium, right? So Jana can do nothing to change the speed. Temperature for the tube has to do with the medium, how hot the medium is. Can I do something to the speaker to give me faster waves? Increasing the frequency of the speaker car will only, it's like Jana having higher frequency, but who says that those waves are gonna go faster forward? Probably they're gonna stay or move slower forward, you know? So I guess car frequency and velocity has, they, they're not related at all. Because I can have a vibration, very high frequency, which is local. And by local, I mean it's not traveling forward. So I'm OK with temperature as answer. But then my question is, Jana, do you think she can do something to increase the speed of the waves 
sent inside the wire, yes or no? Do you think she can do anything? Pull on the string, yes. Anything else? All right, so increase the force, know the force. Thank you, Omar, for responding. I'm very happy to hear from you. So know the force, increase the force. You mean the pull? Yes, probably. You said you can cheat by rotating. All right, so rotating, Kausa, will not change anything, but it's gonna show you some rotational motion and not some vibratory motion. It's only to have less pain on my shoulder. It's cheating, yes, because you will see part, part rotation, part vibration. And the loops are gonna look more visible if they rotate a bit. You know, it's only cheating for it to be visible to you, but yeah. Uh, if my hand is an actual sensor, probably I can be more constant. So I'm not really cheating. I'm trying to communicate something that could not be visible to you. So back to Omar and to Romy, and I like your answers. You need to understand that V, okay, I'm typing here, V depends on the medium only, which means Jana cannot increase the speed. However, the medium in this case is the wire, and the wire is the medium, right? So how can I make the speed faster? The tension in the wire will make the speed faster. If the wire is loose and hanging loose, it's, the wave is going to travel slow. But if the uh, uh, the wire is really tense, you know, so yes, Jana can pull a bit on the wire, it helps, but it's not something Jana did. She modified the medium in a, a bit. So tension in the wire and also the mass of the wire, how heavy. So I'm going to call it the mass of the wire. If it's really heavy, the speed is going to be low. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, it is. So if the mass, it, it is heavy. If it's light, it's gonna uh, probably move your way faster. For, for air, if we're talking about an air tube, you can think of temperature. You can also think of temperature and you can also think of the material, like the medium itself, probably uh, play around with, uh, with the helium or oxygen, you know, some, some uh, gases are heavier than other gases. So this is very important to know because some students, and this is a common misconception, uh, okay, why it was better. They do actually believe that if you move your hand faster, you can make the waves go faster, like and speed faster. And this is not true. The only way to make it faster is to modify the medium and modify the medium means uh, either uh, uh, pull on the wire or lighter wire, you know, some wires are really heavy. And for the air and the tube, temperature or the type of the medium and so on. What else? I think that's it. So we're actually done. It's only the speed that was missing and I added it up. I hope so what we covered so far, yes, increasing the temperature, obviously, we already discussed it here, increasing the temperature will make the particles of gas inside the tube to vibrate faster and therefore to take the wave or the energy and uh, to make it travel even faster. Yes, of course. Yeah, so the temperature will modify the medium. The type of the gas will modify the medium that's for air. For the wire, it's the tension in the wire and the mass of the wire per unit length, obviously. All right, back to our outline, we covered what are standing waves in general. So we know how they happen and we know uh, how to describe them. We studied the case of standing waves in a wire with fixed end and then the tube with one open end and we discussed the conditions. The frequency should be equal to a certain frequency, F1, F2, F3, that are multiple of the first. And any frequency in between will give you randomness and randomness will be low sound, low amplitude, low volume. Then we discussed uh, what nodes are, and we discussed the difference between displacement nodes and pressure nodes. And we discussed the fact that our measuring tool, the, the, the microphone, actually measures the pressure nodes. And by uh, finding the pressure nodes, you can deduce the displacement antinodes and so on. Then we discussed the material needed. Probably we did not list the material needed, but we can do it now if you want. So basically we have a function generator. We have an oscilloscope. We have an BNC cable with an adapter. We have a 
speaker embedded inside our tube. We have the actual tube with the piston and the ruler inside. It is a regular ruler for the smallest subdivision divided by two. We have a microphone uh, connected with its own wire, so I don't need an extra wire to the an oscilloscope. And that's it. Uh, we need an extra thermometer. And this will show you the list of material, the resonance tube, function generator, oscilloscope, speaker, microphone, cables, and thermometer. The thermometer is important. I can show you the experiment here. However, going fast forward through it is not very beneficial because you cannot see a lot. It's important to listen to me talking and to the sound, but it would be cool if we can go a bit. This was done, I think, 10 days ago. So by the way, this copper rod, uh, I used scotch tape. I scotch taped the, the, the microphone on the copper ro rod to move it forward, backward. You can see it later. Here I'm explaining a bit. This is low, low um, precision video. Why? Or probably because I'm moving fast. Function generator. That yeah, the, it's not for super precise. Anyway, the function generator, I'm explaining the amplitude. All this is already done through the presentation, but you can listen to it again. You can see the range more. Yeah, I should ask the the one taking the video to increase the precision. And this is showing, you see the microphone, how tiny it is? Those are microphones used to spy on people probably. So uh, I, when I start the experiment, I'm gonna pull the microphone out. Actually, I'm gonna pull it and make sure it's at the beginning of the tube. I'm not gonna pull it uh, out uh, totally. Okay, changing the frequency. And here you can hear how the sound is getting sharper. You can also observe how I'm playing with the amplitude and how the amplitude is getting higher. Or you can simply ignore the oscilloscope for the moment because we're gonna check it later. I'm explaining the speaker, yeah, the tube, the piston. The piston is white. I don't know if it's visible. Yeah, you see the piston? It's translucent. Yeah. Okay, I'm showing you the ruler. Okay, probably now I'm gonna start. Okay, here I'm pulling the microphone a bit back. Microphone at the, at the left end of the tube. The microphone is attached to a metallic rod just to be able to move the microphone. All right, you can listen to this later. You can hear some sound. By the way, if I talk, the microscope is gonna register some noise if I scream because it's just a microphone, you know? And you can see the amplitude as it changed the frequency. Anyway, I'm gonna pick the frequency needed. I'm showing you how to pick the frequency needed. And I'm gonna start moving the piston. I'm gonna start from the high end, like the longest length and decrease the length slowly while I watch the oscilloscope. And I will see that you're gonna have high amplitude at some point. Wait a second, I'm gonna show you when. So this is low amplitude. Keep on looking at the micros on, on the oscilloscope and you will see that it's gonna go high, then low again. Then low again, okay? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm going fast forward, back and forth, okay? And uh, the position of the piston at which I have the maximum amplitude, this is resonance, okay? Anyway, going fast forward is not a good idea. Let me see if there's anything interesting. That's it. Probably I'm gonna show you at the end, I hope so, how I move the, you see, I'm moving the microphone inside the tube to register maxima and minima. Okay, just to count them. And you can see on the oscilloscope, look, maxima, minima. Then maxima, minima, then maxima, and so on until I finish the whole length uh, of the tube. So remember, a maxima is a node. All right, because this is the pressure maxima or whatever. As you can see, you can draw. So again, let me repeat. Every pressure minima is a pressure node, which is a displacement anti-node. And so on. You know this better than anyone else, I suppose. And that's it. So uh, you can see in this uh, PowerPoint, you have the results ready. So you can start the lab. And you know what to expect. So um, I will not give you a file called results. I will say the results are inside the PowerPoint, okay? You think the results are enough? 
Like I gave you all the smallest subdivision divided by two, needed or not needed, I don't know. Uh, you have to answer some questions only. Let me show you what questions you have, just for you to have an idea about the length of the lab report. And read the procedure, it could be very helpful. Okay. So this is the first uh, question one, calculate the expected value of the speed, knowing the temperature. This you're supposed to find lambda average plus RMS obviously, and V sound. Uh, find the average value along with the error, compare it to the comment on the possible sources of errors, sketch minima and maxima, you take one example, probably one for pressure and one for displacement. Frequency, I already gave you the table full, plot, slope, find the, the speed, that's it, done. This is the lab report. It needs around 20 minutes and you will be done. All right? Yes, so that's it. I will stop recording. I will stay a bit if you guys have any question. And that's it for today.